Okay, everyone, thanks so much for joining us today and taking your lunch hour to learn a little more about our work on offshore fracking and acidizing and ExxonMobil's plan. Um, today, you'll be hearing from our chief counsel, Linda Croft, and our senior attorney, Maggie Hall. Um, we'll get to them shortly, but before that, I just wanted to let you know we will be doing a brief uh, Q&A session at the end. So feel free to submit questions as they come up. There's a little um, Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can use that to submit questions and I'll track them and we will get back to them um, towards the end. And for now, I'm going to turn this over to our Chief Counsel, Linda Krupp. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this webinar. Um, I'm gonna begin by giving a little bit of background um, that may be very familiar to some of you. Um, but for those of you that aren't aware, the first offshore oil drilling in the country actually began offshore Summerland in Santa Barbara County. Uh, this was in the late 1880s. And as you can see, the oil industry would install these piers that extended out um, into the ocean and they would drill the oil and gas reserves that were below the seafloor. And this activity um, created quite a dispute between coastal states like California and the federal government because they both wanted jurisdiction over these new offshore oil activities. They wanted to regulate the activities, but they also wanted the money. Um, they wanted money from rent um, of leases offshore, and they also wanted their share of any revenue from profits, which are called the royalties. So this dispute went on for decades. There were various um, bills pending in Congress and various lawsuits. And eventually in 1953, Congress passed the Submerged Lands Act and the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, which both set the boundary between state and federal waters and jurisdiction at three miles. Platforms uh, started being installed um, offshore California in the late 1950s and really ramped up in the 1960s. And these are some of the platforms that you can see right offshore uh, Santa Barbara, and they're just over the line into federal waters. By 1984, the federal government had issued approximately 80 leases in the Santa Barbara Channel and offshore Santa Barbara County. And the state also issued several leases. However, the state stopped issuing any oil and gas leases after the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969. And in fact, um, the state legislature passed the California Coastal Sanctuary Act in 1994, which prohibited the state from issuing any more oil and gas leases in state waters. And there were a couple minor exceptions, but mostly this law permanently protected the California coast um, out to three miles from any new oil and gas leasing. Approximately um, half of the federal leases um, about approximately half of the 80 federal leases were never developed. And so in 1999, they were up for renewal by the federal government. And EDC led the legal effort to block those renewals based on environmental concerns. And we were joined uh, by the state of California and the counties of San Luis Obispo and Ventura. And we prevailed in the district court and the court of appeals and all of those leases were eventually terminated. So now the only leases that remain, the approximately 40 that remain are leases where production was already occurring um, and where um, platforms were already operating. So that's the current status. Um, those are where the current platforms are. Now I'm gonna turn it over to EDC senior attorney, Maggie Hall, to talk about a new threat that we discovered about a decade ago regarding enhanced recovery techniques at some of these platforms. Thank you, Linda. Um, so yeah, as Linda mentioned, I plan to cover our work on offshore fracking and acidizing. 
So right now we are in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We just had an oral argument and we're waiting for a decision. Uh, but as Linda mentioned, it took almost a decade to get to this point. So I'd love to share with you the story of how we got here and what's at stake. So first, by way of context, as many of you know, the Santa Barbara Channel is one of the most important ecosystems really on the planet. Um, it's called the Galapagos of North America, and that's for its incredible biological diversity. It provides key habitat for blue, fin, and humpback whales, sea otters, sea turtles, and more than 500 fish species. Um, it's also home to many specially designated areas like marine protected areas, the Channel Islands National Park, and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. In our case actually concerns 25 species that are listed as threatened and in, or endangered um, that are affected by these methods. So some are very shocked to learn that oil companies have actually been using the dangerous methods of fracking and acidizing right here in the Santa Barbara Channel in this incredibly sensitive region. Um, so how did we find out that this was happening? Well, we have long worked, as Linda mentioned, to protect our region from the many impacts of conventional drilling, but it wasn't until about 2011 that we started to uncover that oil companies were also fracking um, from these same platforms. So as fracking started to become popular onshore, we had a suspicion about whether these methods might be starting to be utilized um, by offshore oil operators. So we launched a formal investigation under the Freedom of Information Act where we requested all of the records for the permits that are approved for operations from these platforms. And what we found was that the federal government had been basically rubber stamping platforms or rubber stamping permits for fracking and acidizing without ever requiring any kind of environmental analysis or notice or even a public process. It was clear to us that the public and even other government agencies had no idea that this was even happening. So in 2014, we released the report pictured here, detailing our findings and asking the federal government to conduct analysis of fracking and acidizing and issue a moratorium on these practices until more is known. So a little bit of background about fracking and acidizing. The, both practices involve the highly pressurized injection of toxic chemicals to essentially break up the formation and get at oil that is otherwise inaccessible. And these practices bring with them a variety of adverse impacts. So one of the main concerns is the use of these toxic chemicals. We're dealing with chemicals that are F graded, meaning that they contain known carcinogens. And there's several uh, aspects that concern us about these chemicals. First, there's the risk of a spill of the chemicals themselves when they're being transported out to the platform directly into the marine environment. Um, and the process of fracking and acidizing also generates highly toxic wastewater, which is then dumped directly into the ocean. This of course threatens the marine life and the water quality of our region. Another significant concern is prolonging the life of platforms. So the whole purpose of these unconventional methods is to increase oil production beyond you know, what's possible using traditional methods. So we're dealing with practices that therefore extend the life of the platforms as well as all of the related infrastructure. And as we know, unfortunately, this infrastructure is sorely outdated and therefore especially prone to accidents, which can be catastrophic as we've seen in our region and we also had a very vivid reminder of that with the recent spill in Orange County, um, where the source was a pipeline connected to one of these offshore platforms. Another uh, major impact that we're, of course, concerned about is exacerbating climate change by continuing to rely on these fossil fuels. So when we learned that this was happening, um, the federal government had been you know, rubber stamping these permits without any kind of analysis or process. In 2014, we filed our first lawsuit. And the clients in that case were as Environmental Defense Center along with the Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. And we sued the federal government and the agencies that approve offshore oil. The case is called EDC versus Bessie. So that's Bessie's logo pictured there, the agency that approves these practices. And we also got the attention of some major oil industry interests. So ExxonMobil and the American Petroleum Institute both intervened formally as parties in the case. And in that case, we challenged 51 permits uh, for fracking and acidizing that were recently approved at the time without any kind of analysis prepared whatsoever. Um, fortunately, we were able to reach a settlement in that case. It was really a um, landmark 
um, victory in the sense that we were securing the first ever analysis of fracking and acidizing. Um, and in the settlement, the government agreed to look at impacts at the programmatic level, meaning all the platforms in the region collectively. And this also established the first time that the public had a right to weigh in about concerns because as I mentioned before, this was essentially happening with the public being kept in the dark. So this was the first time there was ever any kind of process. Um, the settlement also secured a moratorium on permits. So all fracking and acidizing was banned until the analysis was complete, which is very important to us in terms of preventing on the ground impacts. And then finally, the settlement also improved public transparency of oil drilling by requiring the government to create a website to post drilling applications and permits online. That way we could better see what's happening at these platforms going forward. So unfortunately, even though we were able to have this analysis um, prepared, when it was prepared, it was woefully inadequate. So unfortunately, our only avenue was to sue the federal government again in 2016, um, after they released their environmental assessment, they concluded that fracking and acidizing had no significant impacts whatsoever. Um, but all of their analysis was based on assumptions that really had no basis um, factually or legally. So for example, they assumed that the practices would only occur infrequently, contrary to industry statements that these, these practices were actually critical to operations. And they assumed that the toxic discharges of chemicals would not impact wildlife, but they had absolutely zero studies or analysis to support that conclusion. Um, so as inadequate as the analysis was, they actually did admit harm to wildlife, um, but instead of adopting any ways to protect these um, species, they declined to um, really do any kind of protection for wildlife. So we also sued them under the Endangered Species Act in the second lawsuit. Uh, in the second case, we also had a, a similar case filed by the state of California against the federal government, arguing that they needed to consult about the impacts of on their coastal resources by fracking and acidizing. And we had the same oil industry interests um, intervene in this case as well, including ExxonMobil. And just a side note, the reason that the um, oil industry in particular ExxonMobil is so interested in this case is because their platforms have a history of using these specific practices and they've said that they're um, restarting the San Ynez unit platforms that Linda will discuss these pr practices of enhanced recovery are essential to restarting those platforms. So unlike our first case, this one has not settled. It has been extensively litigated. And in 2018, we actually secured a victory in federal district court. Um, the court ordered a ban on fracking and acidizing permits until the government consults with the expert wildlife agencies, which is really what we wanted to uncover the impacts of these practices before they could go forward. Um, so now the case is on appeal. So although we won in the district court, um, the federal government has appealed to the Ninth Circuit. And this is our Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal Zoom court pictured here where we have um, the different parties, the federal government, ExxonMobil, state of California and EDC before a panel of judges. And so essentially um, that case has been fully briefed and argued and now we're just waiting for a decision from the court. And our goal is a decision that protects our region from these harmful practices for wildlife as well as for human recreation. So now I will turn it back over to Linda to cover the Exxon Trucking and Platform Restart Project. Thank you, Maggie. So on May 19th, 2015, a pipeline carrying oil, whoops, sorry. <laughs> um, on May 19th, 2015, a pipeline carrying oil on the Gaviota Coast ruptured, spilling approximately 450,000 gallons of oil along the coast and into the ocean. This oil was produced from seven platforms offshore Gaviota and that oil was piped to shore and then processed at the Las Flores Canyon plant on the Gaviota coast. And the oil was then transported via the Plains pipeline to refineries outside the county. The pipeline spill then caused all seven platforms to shut down. Um, it also closed state parks, public beaches, 
prevented both recreational and commercial fishing, killed hundreds of marine mammals and other wildlife, and basically wreaked havoc on communities all the way from Santa Barbara County to communities 150 miles down coast. Four of the platforms that were shut down are now permanently shut down and starting to go through the decommissioning process. Um, these are the three platforms um, to the west of Point Conception, as well as Platform Holly offshore UC Santa Barbara. However, ExxonMobil, which operates the three platforms in what's called the Santinez unit, they're circled on the map. These are right off the Gaviota coast. Um, ExxonMobil wants to resume operations. And so immediately after the pipeline spill, ExxonMobil applied to the county for an emergency permit to allow Exxon to truck the oil because there was no pipeline available. But EDC and others convinced the county to deny that permit. And ExxonMobil was forced to apply for a permit through the regular process. And Exxon filed its application in 2017. So ExxonMobil seeks permission to send approximately 70 truckloads of oil per day, um, that's 70 round trips or 140 total trips per day, um, with each truck that's carrying a load of oil, carrying 6,720 gallons, which totals about 470,000 gallons per day, or more than 170 million gallons per year. Um, one tanker truck would cross this path on, on our local highways every 10 minutes for up to seven years. This trucking would allow ExxonMobil to resume production from its three platforms. The Environmental Defense Center represents Get Oil Out and Santa Barbara County Action Network and our own members in opposition to this proposal. And we are also fortunate to be working with a very broad coalition of environmental groups, uh, Chumash bands, businesses, and other community stakeholders. We have three main concerns. First, we are concerned that restarting ExxonMobil's three platforms threatens our coast with another major oil spill. And as Maggie mentioned, uh, we can only look as far as what happened in Orange County uh, last month to be reminded of the inevitability of this risk. Um, in that case, the pipeline carrying oil from the, one of the platforms to shore uh, leaked and caused a massive oil spill. And that can certainly happen with any of the Exxon three platforms as well. Second, we are concerned about the impacts of the trucking. Um, both state law and county policies and regulations prefer that oil be transported onshore via buried pipeline, um, as opposed to rail or trucking, because it's safer. And I know we did have a spill in uh, 2015, but in general, um, spills happen less frequently from onshore pipelines than from these other uh, modes of transportation. And then you also don't have the other impacts that come like um, air pollution impacts and climate change impacts. But in this case, um, the pipeline is still shut down. Um, there is a proposal to build a new one, but there isn't you know, one available now. And so ExxonMobil wants to transport its oil by trucks along 101, so along the scenic Gaviota coast, and then through that uh, dangerous Gaviota curve and tunnel um, that's uh, adjacent to the Gaviota Creek. It's a very you know, windy, narrow road, uh, very, known for very windy conditions and a lot of accidents along that stretch. And then the trucks would traverse up Highway 101, up just past Santa Maria, and then they would travel along Route 166 out to Kern County. And 166 is an extremely dangerous highway uh, known for, you know, a very, it's very commonly known for accidents. Um, it's a narrow road, a lot of unsafe passing. The train is very difficult. Um, emergency response is also challenging because of the narrowness of the road and the train, but also um, challenges involving communication and cell coverage. So that's the proposed route. Um, and so our 
concerns relate to not just environmental impacts if there's an accident and oil spills, but also we're very concerned about public safety. So EDC, along with um, some of our interns that we've hired from UC Santa Barbara, conducted our own research to look into the safety risk along this route. And we actually started out by looking at oil tanker truck accidents throughout the state, um, as well as the county, and then narrowing it, our research to this route. And we looked um, at the last 20 years. And what we found was statewide, just our research um, through Public Records Act requests and, and press research, we found um, over 80 oil tanker truck accidents, and I'm sure there's even more. Um, within the county, we found um, at least a dozen accidents. And then along the proposed route, we found six accidents um, along this route within the last nine years, five just within the last five years. And these accidents resulted in deaths, injuries, oil spills, and fires. What we also learned was that some of the accidents were caused by the oil tanker truck drivers, but many are caused by other vehicles. And so there's really no way to prevent an accident from happening. There was a recent accident involving an oil tanker truck um, just last month in Santa Maria, and it was caused by the fact that the driver was speeding and the driver happened to hit a downed tree. So, you know, shows that we can't always anticipate what's going to happen. Um, another prominent accident occurred on Highway 101 in December 2017. Uh, an oil tanker truck was traveling up 101, kind of in the Goleta area, and a sedan crossed over and hit the tanker truck, causing it to um, crash and spill. And that resulted in a shutdown of Highway 101 northbound for 19 hours in the middle of the Thomas Fire evacuation. So you can see how public safety is really impacted by these accidents. Um, more recently, in March of 2020, there was a tanker truck accident, a single vehicle accident on Route 166. Um, which is part of the route that Exxon wants to use that spilled more than 450, excuse me, more than 4,500 gallons of oil into the Cuyama River just upstream of the Twitchell Reservoir. And that spill spread for about a couple miles downstream before it could be contained. So these are some other um, photographs of accidents involving oil tanker trucks on Highway 166. Um, and we've worked with the Cuyama Valley Community Association on this issue because they are very concerned. Um, in fact, the, the school district board passed a resolution opposing this project because both of their schools are right on 166 and the school bus stops are right on the highway there. So they're very concerned about safety. And then our final concern is about proliferating the development of fossil fuels. And the whole point of ExxonMobil wanting to truck its oil is so that it can restart its three platforms. And allowing ExxonMobil to restart the three platforms um, perpetuates indefinitely their production of oil and gas from those platforms. And it's interesting to note or scary to note that while those platforms were operating before the pipeline spill in, in 20. 15, the um, emit greenhouse gas emissions from that processing plant on Gaviota were in excess of 300,000 metric tons of carbon emissions per year, which is the equivalent of adding 69,000 cars to our roads every year. So if we look at the bigger picture, um, what this project is really all about is more oil and gas production in the Santa Barbara Channel contributing to climate change. So what can we do? Um, the Santa Barbara County planning staff had recommended approval of this project and it was first heard by the County Planning Commission and EDC and our clients and our coalition and folks from around the county uh, were able to convince the Planning Commission that this was a bad idea. 
And the Planning Commission is not the final decision maker, but the Planning Commission did have an obligation to consider the impacts of the project and to determine whether or not to recommend that the Board of Supervisors approve it. And based on all the testimony and evidence that the Planning Commission heard, the commissioners voted three to two um, earlier this month to recommend that the Board of Supervisors deny the application. So that was a very significant action. Um, so now Exxon's application will be presented to the Board of Supervisors. We think it'll be heard in February or March of 2022. And uh, the recommendation from, from the Planning Commission is for the Board to deny the project but there's gonna be a lot of pressure on the board you know, from ExxonMobil and its supporters. So we can't take anything for granted. It's really important that uh, the community speak up again and express any concerns. So um, we need as much help as we can get. Um, you, know, you can engage, you can email the board of supervisors, you can call the supervisors, you can write letters, um, you can submit you know, photographs. Um, you know, explain your concerns, tell your story, make sure you communicate leading up to the hearing, and then you can attend the hearing itself. Um, you can testify at the hearing, which is very effective. And then you can engage other people as well, um, your friends, your, your peers, your neighbors, um, your family, you know, anyone that you think might be interested in either, you know, the impacts on our roadways or concerns about a spill offshore or concerned about more fossil fuel production and climate change, whatever you, know, you think people might be concerned about or whether you are concerned about, it's really important to communicate those concerns. And so if you are interested, please sign up for our action alerts. You can do that through our website and that way we will send you an email when we know the hear when the hearing will be um, and so that you can definitely participate. So thank you for your consideration. And now I will turn it back over to Betsy. Thanks, Maggie and Linda. Um, we're going to launch into some Q&A now. Um, so Mags, if you will join us again. Um, and while she's joining us, I just to remind you all social media accounts so you can follow us there um, and stay up to date on these cases that way as well um, as our email action alerts and newsletters that we sent out. Um, so jumping into the questions here, we want to be conscious of your lunch hour so you guys can all get back to your important work as well. Um, this one's for Linda. You mentioned that there were four platforms that uh, are working on being decommissioned, but the are you is there more platforms that are uh, headed that way as well? There are. Um, so there's approximately 20 platforms in the Santa Barbara County, Santa Barbara Channel region, eight now are permanently shut down. So the four that I mentioned, the three near Point Conception and Platform Holly in state waters near UCSB. And then there's two platforms um, pretty far offshore from Carpinteria, platforms Grace and Gale. Those are permanently shut down. And then there's two platforms closer to shore, um, kind of near Summerlin Carpinteria. Hogan and Houchin that have already have also been shut down. And so there's actually eight total that will be decommissioned soon. Great. Um, and has the federal government changed its approach towards approval of enhanced oil removal projects under the Biden administration? Um. So enhanced remove, I think we're talking about has the Biden administration changed course on offshore fracking and acidizing? Is that the question? Um, I believe so. Okay. Um, so we have not seen a change. Our lawsuit has um, spanned several administrations. Um, unfortunately, we have seen the federal government agencies, Bessie and Bohm, that approved these practices. Um, you know, continue to litigate the case and continue to um, fight our efforts to have more environmental analysis prepared. Great. Um, and a, a couple of questions here actually on decommissioning. Um, when a platform is decommissioned, 
it's it completely removed uh, and also just touching base on what the biggest challenges we envision going forward on these platform um, decommissioning projects will be. Great questions. Um, when all of the platforms were approved by both the state and federal governments, there was a requirement that they be completely removed when production ended and that the rain environment be restored to its natural condition. Um, federal regulations were changed um, several years ago to allow an owner of a platform to only partially remove the platform if the adjacent state had a what is commonly referred to as a rigs to reef program and if the state took over liability and ownership of the platform, so not the federal government, not the oil operators, but the state would take over title, meaning ownership and responsibility and liability. And if the um, decommissioning met Coast Guard navigational safety standards, which means that um, the top 85 feet below the sea surface have to be free of any structures for navigational safety. So the platform, if it's not fully removed, at least has to be partially removed um, to alleviate that safety concern. So California did not adopt such a program until 2010. And then a new state law was passed that does allow an oil company to apply to both the federal government and now the state government um, to prevent full removal of the platform. And that's um, something that would require not just environmental review by the state, but under this law would require a very specific scientific analysis comparing the impacts and the benefits of partial removal versus full removal. And so each platform decommissioning project would be reviewed on its own basis. There would be this scientific study. So that's been the case since 2010. Um, no platforms have been decommissioned yet, um, but now as we talked about, there's eight that are entering that process. I think Platform Holly will probably be the first to go through you know, environmental review and, and that type of um, robust analysis. And you know, EDC's position is we want to make sure that whatever happens is best for the marine environment. Um, so we do have some concerns. Um, we know from other previous platform removals that um, a lot of toxic debris is discharged from the platforms during their life and sometimes is left behind if a, a, a site is not completely cleaned up. That's what's happened offshore Summerlin. So we want to make sure you know, that you know, the site is left clean no matter what happens. We want to make sure that the analysis looks at um, you know, other types of impacts like, you know, attraction of invasive species, things like that. Um, we want to make sure that any benefits are appropriately analyzed um, because although there is wildlife around the platforms now, we don't know what will happen when that top 85 feet of the platform is removed because that is where some of the life occurs and some of the photosynthesis occurs. Um, and we also don't know what will happen if these platform sites then become, you um, fishing sites. So you know, what would that do to the wildlife? So there's a lot of things that have to be looked at. And, and our position is that it's really important to make sure that that review is robust and that there's um, significant opportunity for public input. Thanks, Linda. Um, Maggie, this is for you. Um, we're wondering if you could give a little more information on what the next steps are of the lawsuit on offshore fracking and acidizing. Good question. So it really all depends on what happens at the court. Um, like I said, the ruling, the case is, you know, fully argued and now we're waiting for a decision. Um, so that case involved an appeal of our victory at the district court and at the district court, the court actually required the federal government to do a full process of looking at impacts with expert wildlife agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service and not allow the approval of fracking and acidizing until that, that process is complete. So if, that, if the decision is upheld, then we will be um, expecting to see a robust analysis um, through the consultation process between the oil operator company or the oil company um, agencies and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And in that case, um, the court also ruled in favor of the state of California 
under the Coastal Zone Management Act. So there will actually be a process going forward before the California Coastal Commission that will involve public, uh, an opportunity for public comment for those who are interested. So as long as our victory is upheld, we should see those important environmental processes play out. Can Linda, maybe this is for you or Maggie. Um, we're looking for an update on the status of the federal government's offshore leasing plan and what um, is happening with potential new sales there. Well, this has been an interesting issue. I'll, I'll take this and if Maggie has anything to add, um, she can do that. So, you know, the earlier question was, you know, is there a change with the change in administration? And so on um, terms of offshore oil leasing, we know there will be a change. We're still waiting to hear exactly what it will be. Um, so the uh, Trump administration had proposed opening up the entire coastline of the nation to more offshore oil and gas drilling. Um, it was you know, something that's unprecedented and you know, certainly threatened our entire coast. And, and we did feel vulnerable because we do have a certain amount of oil and gas production here already and some infrastructure. Um, so we you know, definitely opposed that. And when the Biden administration took over, uh, President Biden issued a couple executive orders and they specifically put the Trump program on hold, um, said, you know, we're, we're not pursuing that. Um, but under federal law, the Biden administration does have to come up with its own um, offshore leasing program under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act that I mentioned earlier. So um, we're waiting for that. Um, the Department of Interior solicited public comment on what that might look like, both for oil and gas leasing and development offshore, but also public lands onshore, like Bureau of Land Management lands. And um, comments were submitted and we're waiting for the Department of Interior's report, uh, summarizing the input from the public and letting us know what this administration's plans are. So um, I feel pretty confident that there won't be any proposal for offshore oil and gas um, on the West Coast. There hasn't been, gosh, since the early 1980s. So, um, and that's been with Republican and Democratic administrations. So we're waiting for that. Um, we should hear soon. Um, you know, we're also, of course, concerned about the rest of the country as well. So we will be paying attention. Great. Um, here's a question actually about another one of our cases and we've had a, an important announcement this month. So um, they're wondering if the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary approval, uh, if that were to happen, would stop fracking and acidizing offshore. Do you want me to take that one, Maggie, or do you want to do it? <laughs> um, right. We're not in the same room, so it's a, it's a little bit uh, <laughs> awkward here. Um, so, and I'll speak more generally, but it also definitely will affect um, for that region fracking and acidizing. So this is huge. Um, and we're really grateful to the Chumash um, for pursuing this dream for about four decades now. Um, we are supporting the efforts of the um, Northern Tribal Council of Chumash who officially nominated this area for sanctuary designation. Um, so the proposal would place a tremendous amount of the ocean from the southern boundary of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Cambria all the way down to Gaviota and pretty far offshore. And the main purposes are to protect cultural resources as well as biological resources is one of the most important biological hotspots on the planet. What a sanctuary does is not only protect resources, um, but also prohibit certain types of uses or activities that would threaten those resources. And so in general, oil and gas development is prohibited. So that means that for that entire area, um, there would be no new oil and gas development allowed. And that is significant because if you recall that map I showed back when we had 80 oil leases, probably over 20 of them were in the region that would be protected under the sanctuary designation. So 
It would definitely prohibit fracking and acidizing, but it would also prohibit any new oil and gas development in that entire area. So yeah, right now um, the designation process has begun. So um, if you'd like more information about that, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and Kristen Hislop, our, uh, the senior director of our marine program is very involved in that issue and could certainly share any information, um, but there is a public comment period happening right now. Thanks, Linda. And this will probably be our last question. I know I didn't get to all of them, but um, we will do our best to respond and feel free to always email us at the um, email addresses on the screen there and we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, this is a great question just for taking action and moving forward. Which supervisors are the most important uh, for followers to contact on the ExxonMobil case? Which ones might be on the fence or in favor of the permit? I think it's best to contact them all. Um, I feel like they will all listen. And although you know some may um, you know, be more concerned about, you know, say environmental issues, um, we're also very concerned about public safety. Um, we're concerned about impacts to communities along the, the trucking route. So I think you know each supervisor might have different interests, but as I mentioned, we've got the impacts from the trucking itself. We've got the concern about offshore oil spills, um, and then we've got climate change. And we know from the Plains Pipeline spill in 2015, it wasn't just you know the environment that was harmed. Um, there's several class action cases pending right now brought by oil workers, <laughs> um, by fishers, by businesses. Um, that were impacted by property owners. So um, you know, there's a lot of property owners along that trucking route. So I think you know, there's such a wide scope of potential impacts and how communities and the public and the environment will all be affected. So I would say you know, contact all of them. Um, in terms of the planning commissioners that recommended denial, it was the planning commissioners from the first, second and third districts. Um, so, you know, if you want to focus on you know, reinforcing their recommendation, you could prioritize the first, second, and third district county supervisors. But you know, these these impacts are going to affect the entire county. Great, thanks, Linda. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's twelve forty-five, and we promise to wrap up now. Again, if we didn't get to your question, uh, feel free to email Maggie or Linda or. Kristen Hislop, if it's regarding some of our marine conservation issues, uh, and we'll do our best to get back to you. And this will be recorded, so we'll have it available if you want to reference anything or pass it along. And please stay tuned, sign up for our action alerts, and we'll be in touch. Thank you all so much. Thank you.